Okay, welcome Armando and Terrence and Warren, Tina and Kylan and Constance and Aria and Guadalupe. And Mark. Um, thanks for coming. Um, this is the week five webinar. And what we're going to be talking about today is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem turns out to be the most important theorem of all of statistics by far. There isn't even a second most that's anywhere close to it. So we're going to be using this theorem for the rest of the entire course. An entire chapter on one theorem, and we don't prove it, by the way. That's not part of this class. Um, that would be if you were a math major. But we definitely need to understand this. And um, it's pretty technical, so with a lot of details. So I want to go over what it says and then how to use it in a big way. I want to mention um, another thing that's important. And that is, um, there is one extra thing coming up besides regular assignments. Any of you know what it is? It's the one thing coming up this week. Yeah, the online exam. Okay, so that's something to note. So the thing that you need to think, be thinking about right now is the online exam. The online exam is um, mandatory. It is online. Okay, don't forget the title says online exam. You know, somebody decided to schedule a proctor or library. Um, you don't need to do that um, because it's an online exam. Uh, that's what the midterm and the final exam are. Okay, I think I'm going to um, meet everyone for now because we're getting some messiness. And then if you want to say something, unmute yourself and then talk and then remute yourself when you're done. If that's all right. Um, but again, you're happy to have conversations, but hopefully um, you can hear now. So in terms of the online exam, um, in terms of what it is, again, it is, it is an exam, but it's different than a midterm or a final. First thing, it's not a written exam, it's an online exam. And I figured I'd get through this first, and then we'll talk about the central limit theorem, which is also really important. So the online exam must be taken by Sunday night, but please don't wait till the last minute on this one because it's pretty long. It's not pretty long, it's very long. So um, it's gonna take some time, okay? It will definitely take you some time to do this online exam, okay? And in particular, there are 50 questions on this online exam. And what I decided to do is these questions are basically duplicate questions of the week by week assignments that you've been getting online. Okay, so be ready for that. Okay, there are of course more questions on the assignments total than there are on the online exam, but 50 is a lot. One of the big differences between the online exam and the chapter assignments is that for the online exam, if you get it wrong, you can't try again. So that's what makes it an exam instead of an assignment. So you need to do it right. Okay, so be real careful. And I wanna mention because someone is already complaining, um, Make sure that if it doesn't say what you're supposed to round to, don't round, give, give as many decimals as your calculator gives you, okay? If it does say what to round, you can round and it should be fine. But if it doesn't say, then you gotta keep going, okay? And you just type in as many calculator decimals as the calculator gives you and it should be fine. Okay, so that's just a note about um, rounding issues with the online exam. The online exam um, covers chapters one through six. So everything up and through last week. And what I did is I just grabbed homework assignments, homework problems from chapters one through six. And you're gonna randomly get a bunch of problems that you worked on. But the big difference is, again, you don't get to try again. And another difference is there's 50 questions. So if, I, if you did try it again, you might be doing 500 questions and that's too much. So give yourself enough time and you should be fine, okay? Um, if you want, what's the best way to practice for the online exam? Look at the old exams. 
What's the best way to practice? Any thoughts? No thoughts? Yeah, we do, especially the homework assignments. The homework assignments, because these, pro these problems come right from the homework assignments. The reason I posted a practice exam is the practice exam does not give you the answers. So that's more like the online exam. You can't just like get the answer wrong and then try again. Okay, and some of you wanted a key, but I don't want to give you a key because then you have the answers and it's not a practice exam anymore. So I wanted to give you a practice exam that doesn't give you the key. I wanted to give you a practice exam that is more like an exam. So that's just a note. Okay, um, are there any questions at all about the online exam before I move on to the central limit theorem? Hey, Larry, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Aria. Hi, um, I just wanted to throw that out there that Ward's phone keeps kind of blocking the sound a little bit. Yeah, um, I keep muting him and then he keeps unmuting, so we're, we're battling. <laughs> okay, well. So okay. Warren, if, if you want to say something, please unmute yourself, say it, and then mute yourself again. Because it's, um, it is kind of um, a little distracting for a lot of people. Yeah, so I'm doing what I can. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, but thanks. Yeah, that's important. Again, we don't want to be distracted. But again, if you want to say something, please say something, you know, always unmute yourself and then say something. Okay, um, any other questions before I move on to the central limit theorem? All right, so let's go to the central limit theorem. And what I want to do is I want to just start from a whiteboard. And we can write it out. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the whiteboard. And what I want to do is I want to mention what the central limit theorem is about. And I think I want to do it by kind of the idea of why you care first, and then I'll state it um, directly, okay? Which is, of course, in the long video too. All the details are in the long video um, and in the textbook. So the first thing is this class, hopefully you figured it out by now, is all about sampling. Have you figured that out yet? That's what we do in this class. We look at a sample, we look at the data from the sample, and then we try to understand that data and then make decisions based on it. Isn't that, clear? Isn't that what we've been doing? So in project one, which by the way, I just finished grading just before um, six o'clock. That's why I actually logged in a little later than I usually do because I just wanted to get that last one graded. So I have graded them. Um, some were really good, some needed some work. Um, so it was, a, it was a big mix in terms of projects. Um, but please look at the comments that I made on directly on. But in project one, you took a sample, which is typically what you do, okay? In project one, you took a sample. Now, what I had you do in project one, what you did was you just looked at a histogram, you said, hey, here's what the sample is. Yeah, you looked at the standard deviation, you looked at the mean and say, hey, here's the sample mean. Here's the standard deviations of the, of the sample. The problem with that is that in the real world, you don't really care about what the sample is. That's not what you're interested in. What are you usually interested in when it comes to any kind of real study? You're not interested in the sample mean and the sample standard deviation and the histogram for the sample. What are you really interested in? Any thoughts? The result, I'm not sure what you mean by the result. He is you're not interested in the sample. Thoughts? Maybe I'll say it if there isn't. Okay, what you're interested in is the population. Okay, you're interested in the population. And the bad news is, in most situations, you can't find the population. Okay, you can't, either you can't survey everybody, or it's something that keeps coming and keep making new ones. So as you're surveying, there's more and more happening. You're never gonna get everything. 
Okay, and that's kind of what statistics is about, is we can't get everything. So what we do is we take a sample, and what we're gonna do with the sample is we're gonna make inferences about the population. And like your projects, if you have quantitative data, the most important number that you get from your quantitative data is the mean, is your sample mean. So the question is, if you know the sample mean, do you know the, the population mean? What do you think? Any thoughts? One more guess, Tina? <laughs> yeah, the answer is no. You only got the sample mean. If you, if you ask 31 people that were from California community colleges, you don't know everyone in all California community colleges. You can't know that. You only ask 31 people. Okay, you don't know the population mean. You only know the sample mean. Okay, you also know the sample standard deviation. So then the next big question, and this is a much harder question, is if you know the sample mean and sample standard deviation and all your sample data, I said you don't know the population mean, but can you get a good guess? That's really the question of the entire rest of this quarter, is if you know the sample, can you guess about the population? Any questions on that? So what you wanna say is that if you have the sample mean, okay, there is a population mean which you don't know, but the question is, is how close do you think your sample mean probably is from your population mean? And is your sample mean your best guess for the population mean? Does that make sense? Or based on the sample, is there some better guess for the population mean? Okay, it turns out that the sample mean really is your best guess for the population mean. As long as, and this happened in project one, as long as the way you took your sample was unbiased. Okay, so if you have a lot of bias, then your sample mean is completely useless. Is that clear to everyone? If I went and say, um, I don't know, ask the first class I ever taught, which actually was um, half the class was the UCLA basketball team. And I measured the heights of all my students to get an idea about how tall college students are. That's totally biased and it's a terrible estimate. Does that make sense? Because you don't ask a bunch of basketball players to find out what the average height is of just regular people, because that'd be biased. Okay, be biased because your sample, your sample mean is most likely much higher than your population mean in that case. So you want an unbiased sample. So if you have an unbiased sample, you wanna say, well, how close do I think that unbiased sample is to the population mean? And that has a lot to do with the standard deviation. Because the standard deviation talks about how close data values are typically to a mean. Do you remember that? That's what standard deviations are all about. So now, if you have a sample and you want to find out how close the data values are to the population mean, well, you can't know it exactly, but you can get an estimate. And it turns out the estimate is not the standard deviation. The estimate is a standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So let me put this in some symbols and, and uh, words. So first thing, a couple, uh, a sentence here first, a definition that's really, really important. The sampling distribution. is the distribution of all of the means, actually let's write the sample means, of all possible 
samples that could be taken from the population. where the samples are all of the same sample size. And remember the letter we use for sample size? Yeah, N. Okay, so that's really important. So what we want to think about is say, well, all possible samples that you could take um, Let's look at the distribution of that. This is why that's important. First thing is the mean of all possible samples that you could take. So first thing, now I gotta draw it because it's, um, it's not a nice letter or anything. We call that mu sub x bar. Okay, mu for the population mean, x bar for of the sample means. So if you look at all sample means, that's the population of sample means, look at the mean of all sample means, and the big theorem is that is always equal to mu. It's always equal to the mean of the population itself. So let me stop for a second. Any questions about what these symbols are? It's one of the hard parts about this chapter is getting these symbols and the words. Any questions on that? So mu is a population mean. So that'd be like if you're doing heights of community college students, it would be the, the average of all possible community college students in California. X bar are sample means. And let's say you did a sample of size, I don't know, 20 and you looked at the average of those 20 students, and then you kept doing that, and you did all possible samples of size 20, and look at the average of the averages. That's mu sub x bar. And the theorem says that mu sub x bar equals mu. Again, I don't, I'm not proving this, but you can believe me. Hopefully you all believe me. The more important thing is not to believe me, but to understand what this says. Any questions? All right, so now the next thing is we can talk about the mean of all possible sample means. And that, what that says is that our sample mean is the best guess for mu. Okay, it's our best guess, there's no bias there. But you can also talk about the standard deviation of all possible sample means. And that we're gonna say sigma sub x bar. So that's a standard deviation, that's sigma. And it's all, so that's why I use sigma not s, possible sample means, that's x bar. What that will tell you is how likely a sample mean is to be away from the population mean. So that's really, really important because the standard deviation tells you about how likely you are to be far from or close to. And the big, huge deal about this is it's not equal to sigma. It's much better. It's sigma divided by the square root of n. Any questions about this? Any questions? Okay, so now I want to mention something. This is really, really important. And that is why we care about this. Okay, and if there's no use of it, then let's not do it. Why do you even bother? So why do you care about something like this? So let me ask you, okay, you can put in your chat box, or you can say it, is have any of you ever invested in the stock market? So far, we got a lot of no's. Uh, yes. Parents, we got one yes. So I want to mention something. This is really, we got a couple. There we go, Tina also. I want to talk about different investment strategies and pros and cons. 
So one investment strategy, by the way, with your money is put it in the bank. Okay, so if you put your money in the bank, any guess on what do you think your interest might be if you put your money in the bank? It's a general. Any thoughts? Some of you might know. Yeah, about a percent maybe. Horrible, I like that one from Warren. Okay, percent, maybe 2%, probably, you know, it depends on what kind of account you've got. Um, it's gonna be really small, okay, a percent. But what's your standard deviation? The idea is the standard deviation is zero. Um, if it's FDIC insured, which means that you're going to put your money in, you are going to get 1%. You know you're going to get 1%. The probability of getting anything other than 1% is zero. Do you all agree with that? So what we say is that there is no risk because the standard deviation is zero, but the mean is tiny. So you might think, well, maybe you could do better than that. So I'm going to share my desktop again, because it's always fun. And by the way, um, I do a lot of investing. And any guess, do you think I've done OK or not? What's your guess? OK, the answer is very much. Um, and that's because I understand this stuff. So maybe I'll help you guys make some money. Um, and uh, I mean, again, it depends on how you look at it. I haven't made seven digits, but I have made six digits okay, of, of money, which is not bad. Can you all see what I'm looking at? Can you see the market? Any questions? Hopefully you can see it. Okay, so this is like a bunch of things. Got the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ. Um, there's individual stocks also. Okay, today was a good day, by the way. Okay, it was a very good day for the market. And I wanna mention a couple things. First thing, if you invest in say one stock, let's call it at random just to make life a little easier, then your average annual, on average, your mean is about 8%. Okay, so is that better than the bank? Okay. Yes. Okay. And the answer is a trick question. The answer is yes and no. Because the mean is 8%, yes, but the standard deviation is not zero. Do you all agree with that too? Okay, standard deviation is not zero. The standard deviation is pretty high. Standard, standard deviation is more like 15%. Okay, which means that you actually have a pretty high likelihood of losing money. Not going to zero, but losing money. Any questions on that? Because within one standard deviation, z score of one, you're going to have negative values. Do you see that? Okay, now I want to do something. Okay, don't lose if you don't sell. Yeah, but if, right, right. So that, there's a whole other thing. If you keep it long enough, still one stock could be dangerous, it could go out of business. So there's still a standard deviation, but it is smaller if you keep it long enough. And I, and I do, so when I have money that I am a little worried about risk, risk means standard deviation, by the way, then um, you definitely want to keep it long. Don't want to drop it in, in a day, okay? You don't want to be a day trader on that. On the other hand, I, I actually have been day trading, okay? It's kind of more like week trading. Um, my standard deviation is very high, but my mean is much high, is really high. And that takes a whole lot more than this class, by the way. Um, and I don't do that for all my money, but I call that my play money because if I lose some, it's not going to end my life or anything. It's not my retirement fund. Okay. But I make a whole lot more money on that than I do on the rest. Okay. On the other hand, I want to look at this. Anyone ever heard? Who's heard of the S&P 500? Okay, Tina, I assume you would because you said you invested. And that usually means you've done some Terrence also. Okay, so S&P 500 means that you are, you know nothing, so let me tell you what it is. I don't assume you know what it is. What it means is that there are 500, it stands for standard of core, by the way. There are 500 stocks. It's called an index fund. And there are 500 stocks in the S&P 500. 
I'm going to make a big assumption that's false, but we're going to assume it for this class. We're going to assume that they are independent of each other. Okay, it's not really true, but again, the, there's complications that I can't get into because it's too hard. But let's just assume they're independent of each other. Okay, then for the S&P 500, your average is still going to be 8%. Okay, because the average mu sub x bar is mu and mu is 8%. So if you take 500 stocks and you look at the average earnings in a year, that's going to be the same as the average earnings of all stocks, which is 8%. Any questions on that? Okay. On the other hand, now let me switch. So for the S&P 500, just a second, I have to get things moved around. There we go. What we have is that mu sub x bar is still 8%, 0.08. But now sigma sub x bar, I said it's about 16% normally for just individual stocks, but it's not 16% now. It's now gonna be 0.16 divided by the square root of 500. Any questions? Any questions on what this says? Okay, and I'm making an assumption that everything, that one thing isn't related to the other, and they kind of are. So it turns out you got to do better than the S&P 500. You need to have what's called a very diversified um, portfolio of maybe 500 different things. That could be real estate, it could be international funds, it could be American funds, gold, all kinds of different things. Okay, but if you can have that portfolio of say 500 different items, and then invest there instead of a single stock, then your standard deviation goes down. Now, you can plug in 0.16 over root 500. And I'll do that in Google. You guys can do it too. And you get 0 0.007 about. Any questions on that? All right, so now we see the difference. Okay, what this says, okay, given, of course, we're doing a big assumption that each of the stocks in the S&T 500 are independent of each other, which they're not, but if we could assume that, that means we have almost no standard deviation. It's basically like the bank, except now you get 8% instead of 1%. Okay, and if you can invest correctly with a good diversified portfolio, you get to earn 8%, okay? Whereas you throw it in the bank. Do you know what the bank does with your money, by the way? Any thoughts? They invest it in diversity. They invest it. <laughs> yeah, they invest it in a diversified portfolio <laughs> and they make 8% and pay you 1% and guess what? They're making a huge profit, okay? And they lend it too, they do both, but I think they invest more than they lend. Okay, it's a combo. It's complicated, but that's basically what they do. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so this is a big deal. Not just for money, by the way. Okay, but this is a huge, huge theorem. Okay, here's another thing. If the distribution happens to be normal to start with, okay, if the distribution happens to be normal to start with, so let me draw a picture because hopefully, hopefully y'all remember what it looks like, but I want to draw it anyway. Uh, we're about to constans, but not yet. I got to say what I'm about to say. <laughs> Again, you can't do anything if you don't know the distribution, 
but we're about to know the distribution because that's what I'm about to do. So if the distribution of the population is normal, let me write that out. If the distribution of the population is normal, so is the distribution of the, sam uh, the sampling distribution. which means the distribution of all possible samples. Okay, or sample means. Okay, that's good, except that most distributions aren't normal. Do you agree? But here's what's really good. And this is a major part of the central limit theorem, and this is gonna answer your question, Constance. If N is greater than, any guess? How big a sample size do you think you have to need? Given some subliminal messaging we had to do recently. 30. Yeah, if n is greater than 30, the sampling distribution is approximately normal. Okay, and I want to mention something. In our class, we're going to use that number 30 as our dividing line. Over 30 is good. 30 or less is not good. Okay. Um, it's the, the key word is approximately. Approximately normal means like usually about one decimal place of accuracy, which is good enough for most people. Okay, as soon as you get a small sample size like 15, 16, you're not, even, you're not that close. Okay, if you want two decimal places of accuracy, you might need 100 or so. Does that, does that make sense, Tina? So it is real world, but it's more complicated than, I, than what this one sentence says, because the word approximately is not a very well-defined word. So the, if you want all the true details, you need to be a math major. Okay, and if you're not, then just trust it. So 30 is pretty good. Some people use 25. Um, most books use 30, so I like to use 30. Yeah, accuracy of 5%, 100 work, actually about 45 or so work. 1,000 is way more than you'd ever need for quantitative data. Yeah, so way, way more. Okay, you could do 1,000, but you as long as you have an unbiased sample, you must have an unbiased sample, and they must be independent of each other. That's the harder part. That's much harder. Because even if you have 1,000, if it's biased, that doesn't help you at all. Any questions on that? Okay, so this is a big deal. Okay, now I want to mention something that's really important. And let me ask, can I erase what I've got? Are you taking notes? It's also on the video, but hopefully you can remember some of this stuff. But I want to erase so I can write more. So to sit down and observe on a single day and call it equal to a year is biased. Well, for the stock market, the stock market, the problem is, is not that it's biased, it's not independent. Is that if one stock goes down, other stocks are likely to go down also. Does that make sense? So you lose independence for the stock market. That's a bigger issue for the stock market. Okay. Um, I, you weren't reading the market. Okay, so let me get to the next big, the most important example. And the stock market's pretty important. Okay, again, I have made like serious amounts of money in the stock market. This year, especially actually, this year has been a very good year. And that's because I know how to read statistics and I know how to read Trump, Donald Trump. <laughs> and other people don't, and I make money. <laughs> so I'll just let you know that uh, it's been very lucrative for me. Okay. Um, so let me talk about what an assignment that we have to do today. I mean, not today, yeah, in the next couple of days. And that is the discussion assignment. Okay, for the discussion assignment, what you have to do is you have to post an article 
that goes over a sample, okay? And then you, that at which you're gonna be able to kind of state some kind of probability question. So let me remind you, maybe I'll, instead of do this, let me um, pop in the discussion assignment. It takes a second. And then I can go over and really talk about what's happening because a lot of people are confused about the discussion assignment. I noticed that the people who posted, um, most of them didn't work, okay? And again, that's because you posted a little earlier than you probably needed to because I haven't had a chance to talk tonight. So let me go through the discussion assignment. Uh, let me do a new share, just a second. That one. Okay, so I wanna go through this because this is gonna be a tough one. Okay, so find an article or course video that discusses a survey. So I wanna mention survey, okay, not a census, must be a survey, okay? And it, it's going to have to provide either a proportion and sample size or the mean standard deviation and sample size. If you don't have a sample size, it won't work, period. You can't do it. Any questions on that? The article should be making a comparison to an established proportion or a mean such that over, so like over half the people, or I didn't write this, but if you can like see that a comparison could be made, that might be good enough. So then we're gonna have to do some work and we're gonna have to use essential limit theorem. Okay, and we're gonna use 5% as being what's called significant. So let me show you what I've done and I'll go over and talk about it. So first thing, I posted a, um, an article. So this is an article from Gallup. The nice thing about Gallup, and a lot of others too, Pew does it, a bunch of, bunch of articles will do this. And sometimes CNN will do it too, you know, a bunch of different places. But Gallup almost always does, is they'll give you the information that you need. So Supreme Court enjoys majority approval at the start of a new term. What does majority mean? What does majority mean? More than, okay, good. Better than 590. More than 50%. So majority means more than 50%. Okay, so that you're supposed to know, by the way, that's not a, like some kind of statistics thing. That's just, you're supposed to know that. So majority means more than 50%. So if we go and look at this, just the first sentence, as the US Supreme Court prepares for the opening of a new term, Gallup finds a slight majority of Americans, 54%. Do they know about all Americans? Definitely not, okay? I know for sure, because they didn't ask me. Okay, did they ask any of you? Probably not, okay? I've never, I never get anyone that says yes, okay? So the question is, is this really a majority? Might it not be a majority? So what is the probability that if it is a majority that you're gonna end up getting 54%? Any questions on that statement right there? So what is the probability that if it is 50% that you're gonna get at least 54%? Is that clear? Let me say it another time because it's so important. Okay, so if it was just 50%, 50% is not a majority because you have to be more than 50%. So if it was ex just 50% and you did another study, just like they did, what's the probability that you're gonna get 54 or more? So we need a little information. And that in Gallup, typically at the bottom, survey methods. And that is the survey was 1,525 adults. So let me write down a few things. One thousand five hundred and twenty-five adults, and they got fifty-four percent. Any questions so far? All right. Now this is a little different than the other example in the central limit theorem I showed you. 
Anyone know why this is different? Why you can't do just sigma over root n and mu sub x bar is mu? What's wrong with that? And there's something very wrong with that, by the way. Can anyone tell me? Here's a hint. What was the survey question? Yeah, the survey question is, do you approve of the job the Supreme Court is doing? And the answer is a yes or no. It's not, num not quantitative. So what we need is we need a new theorem. And this is going to be a central limit theorem for proportions instead of for quantitative data, for means. So let me reshare. And let's go to paint again so I can talk about central limit theorem for proportions. So you can still think about the same thing. I'm not going to write down sampling distribution because we already talked about that and it's the same idea, but now it's a sampling distribution for proportions instead of means. So you can think about all possible samples of size 1,525. Any questions on that? So you can think about that. And when you think about that, each sample is going to get a sample proportion. And you remember what you what letter we use for the sample proportion? Uh, N is the sample size. P is the population proportion. What do we use for the sample proportion? How do we write that? The hint does that have to do with brush. P hat. Okay, the reason why we do it this way is that the letter P, if we use Greek, it's pi, and that's totally confusing. You don't want to use pi as a letter for anything because that's two, at 3.14, etc. So that's why they don't use um, Greek for proportions, if you're wondering. If we can use P hat for proportions, that's going to be, that is the sample proportion. Then what we can do is something very similar to what we did in the other, when we had um, quantitative data, is we can talk about the mean of all possible sample proportions. And we'll call that mu sub p hat. So that's the mean of all possible sample proportions you could get using a sample size of 1,525, for our example, of Americans. And the central limit theorem says that mu sub p hat, any guess? Any guess? Is equal to? Not seeing y'all answer once. M? Maybe you mean mu not, and eh, there is no mu, but there's a p. Okay, it might be what you're thinking of, but the symbol wouldn't be right if you used an m or mu. So the idea is p for population proportion. So if you look at the mean of all possible sample proportions, that's always equal to p. Any questions on that? Okay, now there is a standard deviation of all possible sample proportions. And that's going to be sigma sub p hat. And that is going to be complicated. That is going to be the square root of p times 1 minus p over n.
So it's a formula. It's an important little formula. Might want to put on a note card for tests. But one main thing you want to notice is that the denominator is a root n. So it's very similar to means if you have a much higher sample size, then that means that you're going to have a much smaller sigma sub p hat, which means that your p hat is much more likely to be close to the population proportion. Any questions on this idea? Okay. Then um, n greater than 30 doesn't work. So you need to make a, can you promise me something? Okay, I want you to put in your chat box as a promise. Promise that if I ever ask you a question about what sample size you need and the survey question is a yes, no survey question, promise me you will not write down the number 30. Will you promise me that? So you have to say yes. That means you're promising. Okay, and by the way, you might guess what happens if you break your promise. So say yes so you won't forget. Yeah, you'll lose points. So this is one of those promises that you want to keep for yourselves. Okay, you don't want to lose points. Okay, so promise me you won't make that mistake. It is a very common mistake. You must always, every time for the rest of this entire class, ask yourself, what is the survey question? If it is a yes, no question, that puts you in a totally different way of thinking than if it's a quantitative number question. Is that clear? So here we have a yes, no question, right? Do you approve of the Supreme Court's job? Okay. If you have that, first thing, um, you can't even talk about the population distribution being normal because it's a yes, no question, right? You don't have a distribution of a population when you have a yes, no question. But what you can talk about is a sampling distribution. And what you need is a large sample size, but a different structure for the large sample size. What you need is the following. So let's do this. If NP and NQ are both bigger than five, and by the way, five is not bigger than five, just a note, <laughs> then the sampling distribution is approximately normal. Any questions on this? Any questions? Okay, so n, p, and n, q greater than five means that you have a sampling distribution is approximately normal, which means, ah, sorry, that's a good question. Where is q? q equals one minus p. Thanks for asking that, because I forgot to mention. All right, Q is one minus P. So think about it, that P is the probability that someone is gonna say yes, right? What's Q? Q is not N. If P is the probability that someone's gonna say yes, what's Q? Yeah, that's the probability that someone will say no, okay? NP is the expected number of yeses and NQ is the expected number of no's. Any questions on that? And that's just the way it works. So if I'm gonna roll a die, for example, and we're gonna say, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna win if it's a one. Uh, where's one, there's one. We're gonna win if it's a one. We're gonna lose for any of the others. Then we're gonna say P is going to be one sixth and Q will be five sixths. Any questions on that? If I roll it, say, 600 times, then NP 
is the expected number of ones, which will be 100. And Q will be the expected number of everything else, which will be 500. Any questions on that idea? So you have to make sure that the number you expect to say yes and the number you expect to say no should be bigger than five. And if that's true, then it's normal. And the idea of approximately normal. The idea is if it's approximately normal, then we can use our calculator. Okay, so in particular, we can use our calculator. So first thing, let's do some computations. First thing is um, we're going to say, well, what if P is 0.5? What if, what if we had 50% of Americans approving of the Supreme Court? So let's write that out now. Let's do the example. Let's suppose P was equal to 0 0.5. Well, now let's find sigma sub P hat. That's going to be messier. Sigma sub p hat is the square root of 0.5. By the way, what's, um, what's 1 minus 0.5? I hope you can all do that in your head. Yeah, 1 minus 0.5 is also 0.5. It's just a coincidence. That won't always be true. You won't always get the same number. But when you have 0.5, you always will. Divided by the sample size, which is 1,525. Any questions on that? Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit more. Um, first thing is drop that in your calculator. Maybe you can beat me. I'm going to put it in here too. I'm sticking in Google. And I get 0 0.0128. Okay. I don't know if you all got that, but you should practice these kind of things because you're going to have, you're going to be asked to do these calculations. So this is equal 0 0.0128. Okay, so what we can say is the following. We can say that x bar has the distribution, remember that tilde has, has a distribution that is normal, okay? And the mean for that distribution is 0 0.5, and the standard deviation is 0 0.0128. Notice it's an x bar, not an x, not a mu, because it's the distribution of the sample means. Oh, sorry, not x bar. Actually, I made a mistake there. No one caught me on it. Uh, let me get rid of that. It's not sample means, it's the distribution of sample proportions. Let's make it select, there we go. Sorry about the error. It's not x bar, it's p hat. p hat has a distribution that is normal, okay, with mean 0.5, and standard deviation 0 0.0128. What we want to find out is we want to find out a probability. We want to find out the probability that if we get a, take a sample of 1,525, that we're going to have at least Okay, 0 0.54 yes answers. Any questions on this? Okay, the magic 
about the central limit theorem is we know that we have a normal distribution. And because we know we have a normal distribution, we can draw a picture. So I'm gonna draw a picture. You're all used to this picture now. The mean should be 0.5. Any questions on that so far? We want the area to the right of 0.54. How do you find that area? How do you find that area? This you should all know from last week. That's a hint. Uh, can I put a question mark instead of shading it? That's fine. I, I didn't really have enough room for a question mark in my shading though. <laughs> if it's obvious that's what you mean, that's okay. I like shading because that's what you're looking at, but yeah, when, you, when you're drawing, that, that's all right, as long as it's clear what you mean. Again, I never grade for art, but I do want you to, sh to tell the story. That's the important thing. All right, how do we find that? Again, think last week, what do we do? Yeah, it's not the M, actually, it's the normal CDF. Because we're given a value of, uh, on the x-axis, and or on the, in this case, the p-hat axis, and we want to find a probability. So we're going to go and we're going to find the normal CDF. And our low will be 0 0.54. The high will be a bunch of nines. The mean is 0 0.5. And the standard deviation is 0 0.0128. And I can show my desktop, but I bet you guys can do it because we did this last week. Let's see if you can tell me what this um, probability is. So I've, I've actually already done it. Okay, can the probability be 8.89? Can you have an 889% chance of something happening? You should worry a lot. <laughs> You're reading it wrong. Yeah, there's something about your calculator on the very far right of your calculator screen that you're missing. And that's really important. There's an E there. Yeah, yeah, it was probably 8.89 and then it had an E for negative four. <coughs> so what you get from doing this whole normal CDF with the calculator is 0 0.0089 is good enough. Two decimals is fine. Um, when, uh, on assignments on the computer, you got to do what they tell you, but eh, good enough. Is that a high chance, by the way? Yeah, no, this is like almost no chance. Okay, so this says, okay, and by the way, the kind of the the barrier to being a low chance is 5%. So I'm just going to write down. That's less than 0 0.05. Hopefully you all know that. So what we can say is that the authors are doing a good job. First thing we say the data is statistically significant. And the we can conclude with very high confidence that the population proportion of um, Americans 
who think that um, the Supreme Court is doing their job. is more than 50% or a majority. Any questions about this example? Any questions at all? Okay, I wanted to go over this example because we are gonna spend a lot of time on examples like this. And I really want you to see kind of where this is coming from. And this is where it's coming from. So any questions at all about the central limit theorem for means or the central limit theorem for proportions? Any questions at all about that? Okay, let me uh, give you something. And that is a secret word. I'm still gonna do a little bit more, but I. I like to do a secret word a little before we finish. So let's pop in secret word. How about in green? And the secret word today is normal because that's a big deal. What the central limit theorem tells us is that as long as your sample size is big enough, if you have quantitative data, then big enough means more than 30 in our class. And if you have qualitative data, if you have the yes, no data, and it turns out other data too, but that's another week. But for yes, no data, then you have to have the NP and NQ bigger than five, or the expected number of yeses and the expected number of yet no's must be more than five. Okay, so if you have either those things, okay, whichever you happen to be looking at, then you can say that the distribution is approximately normal. Okay, if you don't have them, then the distribution is most likely not approximately normal. Okay, for means, when will it be approximately normal, even with a small sample size? Any thoughts? When will the sampling distribution, the distribution of all possible X bars be approximately normal? Not uniform. If the, if the original distribution is uniform, then it turns out you don't get an approximately normal distribution. And in fact, I can show you that. Let me, I wanna demonstrate the central limit theorem. So I can actually talk about the uniform thing because I actually made something for this. Uh, let me go find it. This is, um, where is it? That one maybe. Nope, not that one. Try that uh, new share. That one. There we go. So I had to find the right screen. Okay, so I, I created something just for fun or for teaching fun. And that is under statistics computation. And we can look at computation, it's the discover central limit theorem. So if we take a uniform distribution, okay, so this shows you with, if you start with a uniform distribution, and let's say you have n equals two, it's not quite approximately normal, okay, it's interesting, okay, it does, it's not that different from normal, but it's kind of like a triangle, you see that? 
It's not like smooth and curved bell shaped. It's more like a triangle, it turns out, if n is two. Okay. Okay, on the other hand, if you did n equals 36, now it's starting to look normal, isn't it? And notice that your sigma sub x bar got small. Because if n is 36, that means you're dividing by six, because square root of 36 is six, and the standard deviation is going to be one sixth the standard deviation of the uniform distribution. Any questions on that? If we started with a normal distribution and we had n equals two, now it's still looking pretty normal, isn't it? Okay, so it's a little squished in by a square root of two, but it does look pretty normal. On the other hand, if you start with, say, a skewed left distribution and did n equals two, you're not even close to normal. Any questions on that? So it's kind of complicated on what sample size you need to be able to have an approximately normal distribution. It depends how far off from normal you are. Okay, in our class, we'll just call it 30. Over 30 is good. Um, it's more complicated than that, and I'm not going to get into the complications. Okay, you could even do, I don't know, some fun distribution. How about that distribution? Kind of looks like, like where I hiked last weekend, a lot of little mountain peaks. And if we did n equals 100, how many peaks do you think there's going to be if I do n equals 100? Yeah, just one, because it should be possibly normal, and there it is. And it looks beautifully normal. On the other hand, if you do n equals two, it's probably not going to look as normal. Not too bad, this one. But definitely not as normal as it could have been. Any questions on this? OK, so be careful. If you have proportions and you have a small sample size, then you don't do any of this. OK, you can use binomial distribution. That we can do the stuff with binomial. But with proportions, you can't even touch normal distributions or even talk about it. Any questions on that? And small meaning NP and NQ are five or less. Okay, NP or NQ is what I meant. Okay, or both. Any questions on this idea? Okay, so let me reshare and I'm gonna talk about one more thing. We still have some time. Let me erase what we had. All right, so I want to remind you, um, for the essential limit theorem for means, we had a few things. One, let me the rush. We had mu sub x bar. equals mu. And we had sigma sub x bar was equal to sigma over root n. Remember we had those, those were big important formulas. All right, well sometimes a mean is not what you're most interested in, in quantitative data. So for example, let, let me do a business example. Let's suppose that, that you own a, I don't know, since we're in, I'm in Tahoe, let's suppose you have a snowboard shop. At the end of the day, it's not the mean amount of money that each customer spends. What do you really care about? Profit? but not the mean profit that each customer spends. What are you most interested in? The total, yeah. All that matters is how much money you got in your cash register. Do y'all agree? So the nice thing is that how do you get the total? There's a nice easy formula. If let's say you're, you had um, 100 people come to your shop, 
and the average was $50 each. How do you find the total? This is not a trick question. It's supposed to be easy. So what would the total be? So if you had, again, 100 people come to your shop and the average was $50 each, yeah, you just multiply, okay? You multiply 5,000 because you go 50 times 100 is 5,000. Similarly, the good news is if we want to find the mean for all possible totals, okay, and this is something you may or may not remember from math, but the way we use, the letter we use for total is that guy. Okay, so I don't know if you remember how to pronounce it. Unfortunately, you pronounce it with sigma, but I'm gonna use capital sigma, okay? Because that's what it really is. Whereas this other one with standard deviation, that's lowercase sigma. So mu sub capital sigma x is equal. Well, it's very simple. You just follow the rule. It's gonna be mu times n. You multiply. Any questions on that? And the good news is sigma, lowercase sigma sub capital sigma x. So the standard deviation of all possible totals. This one, we're going to do a little math. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to multiply by n. Let's see if I can open this up. Let's see if we get any good math people. Is what is n divided by root n? There's a much nicer way of writing that down. Or one over root n times n, same, same idea. Still gonna have our sigma, so I'm gonna start writing that. You don't know? One over n, not quite. n over root n, it turns out, is just root n. So that came from algebra. So sigma sub total is equal to the population standard deviation times the square root of the sample size. Any questions on that? Another way we can say this is that sigma of x, capital sigma, the, the total is approximately normal as long as you have a sample size bigger than 30 with mean mu n and standard deviation sigma root n. Any questions on that? All right, I want to let you know and give you a big fat warning is I'm going to ask you questions and I'm gonna ask you to write down the sampling distribution. If I say write down the sampling distribution, just let you know, let me give it a good old arrow. That means that you can have a tilde, okay? So if I say write down the sampling distribution, you're gonna write down the variable you're interested. That's either gonna be p hat, x bar, x, or sigma x, capital sigma x. Then you can write tilde. If it's normally distributed, you can write n, and then you can write the equations. Any questions on that? Okay, when do you think I'm gonna ask you to write that down? Which test? Yeah, the midterm, not the online exam, but the midterm and the final. The reason I don't ask you um, for the online exam is the online exam only covers till chapter six. And um, it's an online exam on computer. It's too hard to type these in on a computer. Do you all agree? Okay, so even if it covered chapter seven, which it doesn't, it's too hard to type this in. My guess is none of you know how to type, the, how to put all this stuff on a computer, it's really hard. But on a piece of paper with a pencil or a pen, you better know how to do that. 
okay? And not just the midterm. And any, any, any guess on where else you're gonna have to do it? The final, okay? It's a guarantee, by the way, okay? Um, maybe the project, it depends on what you're doing in the project. So we'll talk about the project. Um, I'm not gonna ask in the project to write down these symbols. Um, it's just too hard in the computer. And you can trust me, it is brutal. Okay, but I do re require you to know how to do problems where there's gonna be four steps. So let me tell you the four steps you're gonna have to do. Okay, so let me tell you what the exam is gonna be. This is midterm and final. Step one is write down the distribution. So write down the distribution is these weird symbols with the tilde, got it? Any questions on that? Okay, step two is going to be, show your diagram. What do you think show your diagram you're gonna to have to do? Yeah, you're gonna draw, what do you gonna draw? Yeah, bell-shaped curve. And you're gonna to have to draw where that mean is. And that mean, if you're doing a total, you have to multiply by n. Otherwise, everything is gonna be messed up for you. If you're doing an x or an x bar, you don't multiply by n, you got it? And if you're doing a p hat, then it's just gonna be p. Step three is gonna be do the calculations. And that's gonna be either gonna be a normal CDF. I could have you go backwards and you do inverse normal. Okay, so I could say that, you know, um, what is the first quartile of all possible samples of size 30 or something like that. And then you do an inverse normal instead of a normal CDF. Any questions on that? And then step four, any guess on step four? Something that came from the central limit theorem that's not addressed in one, two, or three. Any thoughts? Do you need to assume the distribution is normal? How do you decide on answering step four? How do you decide on that? Any thoughts? Not seeing y'all jump in. All right, well, if you happen to just have one individual selected and you want to find a probability and you use normal CDF, you absolutely need to assume the distribution is normal or you can't use normal CDF. Do you agree if it's just one person? Okay, if you have quantitative data and the sample size is not greater than 30, then you need to assume the distribution is normal. If your sample size is bigger than 30, then the answer is you do not need to assume the distribution is normal because the central limit theorem tells you it's normal. If you have a yes, no question, then you don't need to assume the distribution is normal of the for the population if n, p, and n, q are greater than five. So there's lots of different you know, choices here. Any questions on that? So it depends which category you're in. And you have to think about what category you're in and you have to focus on these different four things and you wanna practice answering these questions. Any questions on that? I wanna mention one more thing, and this is gonna be from now till the end of the class now. Uh, where does the 5% come in? Um, 
Not 5%, 5. Greater than 5? Not 5%? Not sure, Tina, which, what you mean by 5%? Yeah. So greater than 5, that came from the central limit theorem for proportions. Yeah, so if you have the yes-no question, then we have to have greater than 5 for NP and NQ. If you have a quantitative question, you have to have sample size greater than 30. Okay, so that's a lot of a lot of details in this particular chapter. Uh, do you all agree? Okay, I didn't have enough time to go through examples of everything, but there are examples of everything you know involved. I want to give you a very strong recommendation. And let me go ahead and let me find it just a second. Okay, hopefully you can see, you can all see the homework. Okay, so this is what your homework assignment looks like. This is, it's starting to get much more, much deeper. So here's my recommendation and the way you should do the homework to prepare you for the midterm and the final for this chapter. And also other chapters are gonna be kind of similar to this idea. And that is read this first paragraph. So this paragraph says the average amount of money spent for lunch per person in college cafeteria is $7.50. And the standard deviation is $2.65. Suppose that 18 randomly selected lunch patrons are observed. Assume the distribution of money spent is normal and round all the answers to four decimal places. So what I recommend you do is don't read anything else beyond that paragraph and answer one through four by yourself without looking below. Then look below and answer all the questions. So you'll notice what is the distribution of x? x is normal. Turns out that you're going to have a 7.5 for the mean. You're going to have 2.65 for the standard deviation. What's the distribution of x bar? x bar is approximately normal. Now your mean will be still 7.5, but your standard deviation will be 2.65 divided by the square root of 18. Okay. Then it asks you for a probability. So that's the, both of these are basically um, uh, number three on the list that I gave you. And then finally, it says, is the assumption that distribution is normal necessary? Notice I ask you these things. Okay, but practice writing it out and keep a journal. And then you'll do much better on the midterm and the final when you're asked to do this. Notice when, not if. Okay, I'm not going to necessarily ask you about money spent for lunch, but you're going to see these types of questions on the midterm and final, and you want to be able to do those. Does that make sense? And then go ahead and type in all the things after you've already written it down before you even looked at A3, because you know that they're all coming. Okay. Okay, C and D, you're gonna have to at least see these numbers or you can't do it. But for A, B, and E, you should be able to do. I wanna mention something, and it's, some, it's English actually. Today's a little bit longer day, but I try not to go over 7.30 at least in the regular. And that is an important word. Uh, just a minute, let me share. That one. It's a word that a lot of people have trouble with. What does the word assume mean? Anyone know? This is an English question. Yeah, it's a guess. You just take it as true even though it probably isn't. Does that make sense? Okay, and in fact, the way I like to remember it is what's the first three letters? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So a lot of times they say assume is making an ass out of you and me. I don't know if you've heard that before. So 
you never want to have to assume anything, okay? So you'd much rather have a large sample size, okay? This whole assumption is a bad idea, okay? So if I say at the top, assume the distribution is normal, and I say, do you need to assume the distribution is normal? The answer is yes. If you don't have a sample size over 30, I said assume. So yes, you need to assume. On the other hand, if the sample is over 30, then that sentence, assume it's normal, is not needed. So when I ask that, that's what I mean when I ask it. Exactly. So the one I showed you, uh, the sample size was 18. Um, 18 is certainly not bigger than 30. This was quantitative. So that means that you can say the number 30. And yes, you must assume the distribution of the population is normal or you can't do any of the calculations. If you can't do any of the calculations, then you're pretty much lost. Does that make sense? But the good news is any good study has a sample size greater than 30. Okay. And for the yes, no question, any good study is going to make sure MP and NQ are greater than five. Okay. Bad studies sometimes don't, but a good study will have that large enough sample size. All right. I think I'm going to call it because it's 727. I don't want to go more than three more minutes. Okay. But I'm always happy to answer questions. I'm going to stop my share. Okay. Um, so we're at the point where I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Don't forget about the um, online exam. It's long, um, but it shouldn't be too stressful because you can do it at home. And you can um, obviously use your calculator. You're going to want to do that. Take your time, but it's long. So if you take too much time, you'll get too tired. So any questions at all about anything? This is your chance. Okay, you too, Constance and, and uh, Warren, have a great night. Hopefully I didn't confuse you all too much. Okay, but I'm always happy to answer any questions you might have. We talked about a lot today. And it's very important the central limit theorem. We'll be using it every week now. Uh, do we email you the practice exam? A uh, practice exam is just a practice exam. It's not, that's just for your practice. You just do it. Okay, it's not even a requirement, but it'll help you practice for that. It'll also help you practice for the real exam, for the midterm, I mean. So it's, I put it up there now, even though you probably won't spend too much time on it until thinking about the, um, the midterm exam. Does that make sense, Ivan? So there's no points for it. No, I don't do that. The, yeah, you don't get extra credit. There's no points for it. It's just, um, it's there for your own practice. I try and give you lots of extra questions. Any other questions? Okay, you two have a good night, Tina. Have a good night, Eileen. Okay, any questions? There's one last on the phone. I don't know who you are, but. Oh, actually, Guadalupe, any questions, Guadalupe? I did have a question about the NMP. This is Rashim. I wanted to know if you could do the example, or is there an example in the book about the binomial? Uh, well, the example I showed you, um, remember I did the example of what I posted on the, um, for the NP? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't put that in. So let me put that in. I didn't go over it, but let me go over it. That's a good question. Let me do it. Um, let me reshare. Let's go back to paint. Get rid of this. Okay. So what we had was a survey, if you remember, it had 1,525. You believe that? So n was equal to one thousand five to five, 
And what we did is we said we were saying that our assumed proportion is 0 0.5. That was the P equals 0 0.5. So NP is equal to 1525 times 0 0.5. And that is equal to what, 762.5, if I did it right in my head. And certainly, hopefully you know, that is definitely bigger than five. And Q is equal to 1525 times one minus 0. 0.5. And that just happens to be, it won't always be true with this, but this particular example it is. It's also 762.5, which is greater than 5. So therefore, the sample size is large enough to um, conclude. Notice conclude is different than assume, very different. Conclude is a good thing that the, dis oops, that the sampling distribution is normal. Does that make sense? Yes, and I can understand it a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah, sorry I didn't go through the example again. I, I was, I had a lot to do today. <laughs> Did you notice that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a lot of details in this, and this is really important. This particular um, chapter. Okay. Any other questions? I'll stop the share. Any other questions? Ashima Guadalupe? No, thank you. Have a good night. Okay, you have a good night too. And Guadalupe, you've been quiet, so that might mean that you don't have questions. I right, here we go. So for last, yeah, so make sure you watch the webinar again. Watch the long video, the Chapter 7 video, and read the book, the Chapter 7 book. So this is just the beginning of trying to figure it out. There's a lot of details today. Okay, and then if you still don't understand, post on the Q&A form any questions you might have. And of course, you're going to do lots of practice problems. All right, you have a good night too. And for all of you who are watching this as an archived webinar on YouTube, which we posted in a couple hours probably, um, thank you for watching. And please post on the Q&A forum any questions that you might have. And please don't wait till the last minute to do the online exam because it does take some time. So have a wonderful night.